We've been in the series, Life with a Limp, uh, where we've been examining what does it look like to be fully human in a fallen world and to find God in the midst of it, where you have majesty mixed with misery. There's, there's highlights, there's glorious times, there's rah, rah, Nigeria won World Cup. Not in the World Cup, but soccer, amen. I'm a casual soccer fan and I'm a missionary in Miami, so I'm trying to become one. But you have those highlights and you have hard times as well where, where life is sour, it's not sweet, where you, you bury friends early, where, 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 where babies weep randomly in the middle of the night. It's, it's mixed with sorrow. But, but how do we trace the hand of God through it all? We're closing that series today appropriately with a man who will live his life with a limp, Jacob. There's a famous story found in Genesis 32, which is where the bulk of our time will be, where he is wrestling with this stranger who he'll find out is actually God himself. And many people use this story um, appropriately to talk about the wrestle or the tension of walking with God. Some use it inappropriately uh, to try and create a pathway where we force God through our strength, where we force God through our effort to bow and bend to our will. And that's just not the way it works. And so I want to avoid that at all cost because there's a richness, there's a beauty, there's a profound truth that Genesis 32 uh, gives us, but it's layered. It's layered. You see it not just with Jacob, but you see it with God. There's a layered beauty here that I want us to see. And so that'll actually um, like kind of form the movement of our time. We'll just unpack the layered beauty here, a picture that's found in Jacob and a picture that's found in God. And then we'll close with what I hope will be a challenge that will carry us through July, um, but hopefully for the rest of our life. But before we get to this layered beauty, um, there's a lead up here. This is found in Genesis. The story of Genesis uh, frames the rest of the Bible. Um, most commentators, most would articulate that if you understand Genesis well, you get what God is doing through the rest of the scriptures. We find that in Genesis chapter three, where God articulates why things are the way they are, why we do live in a world where we are touched by misery. He, he articulates that it's called the fall. And immediately after the fall, you get the first promise, a promise for salvation, a promise for renewal that will completely change everything. Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelion, the first gospel. I am going to send a seed and he is going to deal with everything around you. And then the rest of the scriptures play that out where you're trying to understand this seed and God through this seed is going to bless all of creation. The video showed that God is going to establish a family by which he's going to bless the rest of the families all across the globe. That family is going to come through Abraham. He's the patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We're going to look at Jacob's life, but his story is profound. He's just like his fathers and his sons will be just like him as well. And they're the least likely candidates to be the impetus of God blessing the rest of the world. Abraham cheats on his wife. Sounds like Miami, sounds like our world. But that's Abraham's story. How do I get God's blessings my way? Ah, great idea. Let me use my slave girl. Cheats on his wife. Isaac, same thing. And then he has this passive nature to him where he parades his wife as his sister. So that if anything happens when he's in this foreign land, it wouldn't happen to him, it would happen to her. That's passivity. That's using power to harm other people. We saw that with David last week, right? But not only is there this brokenness in them, there's brokenness around them at every corner. It seems like there's fighting for their lives where they're struggling to survive, where even their own family is doing evil to them. Abraham's brothers, Isaac as well, Joseph, where even in Joseph's story, maybe you've heard it, maybe you've seen that animated video, Joseph in the coat of many colors, and he has these dreams God says that he's going to be the guy to kind of rule his family to some degree. 
He tells his brothers they get frustrated. They sell him into slavery, into Egypt. He's there. God, through circumstances, creates this famine where they, now they have to go to their brother to go get life. Their father dies. They're terrified. Oh, snap, our dad has died. He's like the one buffer between us and our brother. What are they going to do now? What is Joseph going to do to us now? And Joseph makes this statement in Genesis 47, 9. He says this, or 50, 20. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And what what that signifies is not just the story of Genesis, but the story of life. It is the rest of the scriptures where we see evil at work in us, around us, but God at work at, as well, maneuvering, using, majestically, gloriously broken things to accomplish beautiful things. And Jacob, Oh my, Jacob's life models this in profound ways. And I need to get us there because oftentimes if you're like me, you start to discount certain people and discount certain situations. God can't possibly work there. If I'm honest, that's kind of where I lean at times when I'm frustrated or I'm just soaking in my own sorrow. But what we see is broken people, broken situations. They don't stop or even subtract from God's plans. They're part of it. Like broken people, broken situations don't stop or subtract God's plans. They're part of it. And the more we lean into that truth, the more life we'll find as we're trying to navigate living in a fallen, broken world where things don't go right all the time. Even when the brokenness externally or internally is self-induced. When we can't blame anybody else, we have to look in the mirror and say, I did this. The reason why I'm here is because of me. Even when that's the case, it doesn't stop God's plans. It's part of it because God works almost even more majestically when we are the ones who have created the brokenness because it's in those moments where we realize that we are being brought to the edge of ourselves. I can't. And God says, welcome, let's get to work. And so Jacob's story lays out this a beautiful um, scenario and it unpacks this beautiful truth. Um, let's start with the lead up and then we'll, we'll camp out in um, the actual wrestling Verse um, three, um, and Jacob sent messengers before him uh, to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob, I've sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. Excuse me. I, I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants, and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he's coming to meet you and there are 400 men with him. That's a lot. 400 deep. Verse seven, then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. So to this point, if you know Jacob's story, if you're familiar with the, the story of his life, he's a twin. He has a twin brother named Esau. He cheats his twin brother out of his birthright. And so his twin brother comes in, Esau. He's a man of the field, kind of your UFC manly man type dude. And so he comes in from hunting. He's dying of hunger. He's thirsty. And he's like, yo, brother, I smell this soup that you're cooking. It smells great. Give me some or I'm going to die. Hmm, I got a great idea. How about you give me the rest of your life and I'll give you this bowl of soup. Sure. What, what is the rest of my life and my birthright good for if I don't make it past this moment? So he exchanges the future for the present. Then he's frustrated after the fact, rightfully so. Not only that, so 
Now his, his father is getting ready to pass. So his father, his, his sight is fading. He's an old man. He's getting ready to sleep and rest with the Lord. And he wants to bless his older son, which he has more favor on. So he calls him. He says, yo, yo Esau, go hunt because you're a manly UFC guy. Go hunt. Cook me some good food and I'm going to give you a blessing. Jacob's mom overhears this, says, I have a great idea. Go kill this goat in the backyard. We're going to put the hair of this goat on you so that you could pass off as your brother. I'm going to make this great soup and you're going to give it to your father and he's going to bless you. That's a great idea, mom. He does it. Are you sure you're Esau? Yes, father. Blesses him there. As he gets the blessing, he walks out. Esau walks in. Father, yo, what happened? Frustrated, rightfully so. Ah, I already got one blessing. There's no more blessing for me. There's none more to give you. Truly, he will be blessed. Truly, you'll serve him. Esau has this plan. He says, look, when my father is dead and the time of mourning has passed, me and my brother are going to have a sit down. That's code for I'm going to kill him. All right. I'm going to end his life. Jacob's mom gets wind of this, sends him away, sends him away. Now he's en route back. So the last time he saw his brother, he was cheating him out of his blessing. The next time he's going to see him face to face is going to be different than what he feels now. But right now he's terrified, rightfully so. So if you know the story, you know how it ends and you may be removed from the emotional context of what's happening. I just cheated this dude who swore he would kill me and now he's coming with 400 men. That's not an entourage. That's an army. Are you tracking with me? That's not like a welcome party. Like, yo, brother, I haven't seen you in a while. We're going to throw this huge party. No. That's, oh yeah. Now's the time. I've been waiting. At this point, about 23 plus years, I've been waiting. Oh yeah, and I'm ready. 400 deep. He's greatly distressed, but it's a beautiful lead up because it sets the foundation of desperation. He's desperate. He's afraid. And any one of us would be. But desperation becomes the soil for authentic encounters with God. It is in those moments where we are full of emotions anxious, frustrated, afraid, feeling like all the options are gone, that God comes in and says, let's have an authentic face-to-face, -face, an authentic interaction. And so even from the beginning, what's looking like a terrible situation is really an opportunity for God to come in and flex how beautiful and powerful he actually is. Nevertheless, he's desperate, rightfully so. And it leads him to do two things. The first thing it leads him to do is to scheme. So he has this great idea. Okay, look, I'm going to divide my people again. And that's what he says in verse eight. Think it, if Esau comes to one camp and attacks it, then the other camp that's left will escape. That sounds like wisdom. That's good scheming. This is who he is. He schemes. That's what his name means. Deceiver, wrestler. He kind of maneuvered things all the time. This is who he is. So I got a great plan. Let me just divide the camp and we'll only lose half of our resources. But he doesn't just stop at scheming. He does something better. He seeks God. And that's the beginning of what's beautiful. Verse 9. And Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and the God of my father Isaac. O oh Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do good. I am not worthy of the least of all of these deeds of steadfast love and all of the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan. And now I have come, I've become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me. The mothers with the children, but you said, I will surely do good to you and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. So he stayed there that night. There's beauty here. There's a lot of it. One, he's modeling a progression of maturity. 
Like, so, so if you know Jacob, he's a schemer, he's a trickster, he's the biblical version of Loki, all right? Now, what that means is when you are faced with danger, you run. He already sent word to, to that, that, that Esau was coming. They came back with 400 deep. He's going to come kill you. That's kind of what he's going to understand. And you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't go back. Now, that's a great option for some of us. Oh, shit. 400? How many do I have? I'm going to. He doesn't go back. The reason he doesn't go back is found out in the prayer is because earlier in Genesis, God told him to go back to his former country and that God would be with him. So he's acting on faith right now, not on who he normally is. There's a progressive maturity. And even for us, like all of us scheme when plans don't go our way, when we're faced with stuff, we kind of scheme. That's humanity. But the more we could close the gap between scheming with our plans and seeking God for his, the more mature we'll become. And as that gap gap gets closed, when it gets eliminated, we'll find a greater level of faith. And so there's a progression to his maturity there. He's seeking God through prayer. And this prayer is beautiful, it's sincere. He says, I'm afraid. I have nothing to hide, God. Here's my heart, I'm terrified. There's an army coming my way, and it's just me, my family, and some of my men, of which are already gone. I'm afraid. That's sincerity. But there's substance to it, too. He is using the word of God as he's praying. God, this is what you said. You told me to go there. You said that you would do good to me. He is speaking back to God what God spoke to him first. That's a model for prayer. I heard it once said that we shouldn't read the Bible as much as we should pray through the Bible. That we should pray through what we read in every story that God would make it so. And every promise that is found that God would make it true and rich to us. And that's what he's doing. He is is speaking back to God what God has first spoken to him. And there's resolve in this prayer. The resolve in this prayer is that I'm going to do it, God, because you said and it's seen at the end he stayed the night he didn't run i'm god do me good i've now laid my heart bare before you do as you please oh god some would say that what's happening here is really a picture of what's going to happen when he physically engages with god and i believe that that what, what's happening right now is that Jacob is wrestling with God in prayer before he wrestles with God in the field. And that's how it is. The faith of Jacob is birth in rich ways through prayer before him and God even wrestle physically. There's a beauty there that we're meant to see. But there's a beauty of transformation. We're looking at Jacob right now. There's a beauty of transformation. So he ends up not doing what he would normally do, which is just kind of go his own way and leave. He ends up staying, and this mysterious man begins wrestling with him a little bit. And as they wrestle and they tussle, he holds on, he's striving, and, and, and this, this, this man dislocates his, his hip, and then he holds on even tighter, and the man says something to him. He says, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God, with men, and have prevailed. The way that this wrestling encounter is written is such that we would see that this is a converging of all of Jacob's life. That there are two dominant themes of his life that are meeting in this moment. One of those themes is blessing. That At the beginning of his life, it was told that he would wrestle with his brother, but that the blessing would actually belong to Jacob. So from the beginning, the blessing that he was scheming to get was his already. That's what God said. But then you see him going. He said it here. I I, I crossed the Jordan with nothing, but I'm leaving back with two camps. I'm leaving blessed that even as he's now wrestling with Laban, his father-in-law, 
he's going to come out on the other side better, more blessed. And in this moment, the blessing that he now secures from God, it's converging here, blessing. But the other theme is wrestling with Esau, with Laban, with his dad, really with his self. And we're meant to, to see it. it. It starts off, it says this, um, verse 22, that same night he arose, took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jacob. And you get down, it says, this man came and wrestled with him. The, the word for that in Hebrew is the same word for Jacob. So the idea is this man came and Jacob with Jacob. He came and tussled with a guy who's been spending his entire life tussling. So his whole world is converging in this moment. And he is leaving transformed. Who are you? Jacob. The man didn't ask that because he didn't know his name. He asked that because he was confronting his identity. The very nature of your life has been wrestling. And you think that you've been wrestling with Esau, with your father and with your father-in-law. You haven't been wrestling with them in as much as you've been wrestling with me. This is God talking. Now let's do some work. Oh, he's being transformed. Keller um, Beast, he said it like this. Sometimes God has to wrestle us into a transformed life rather than comfort us into one. And I like that because it's true. God has good intentions for this man who is broken, who is a schemer. And the way he's going to bring them into those glorious intentions is not through pillows and butterflies and cupcakes and roses and marshmallows. It's through a bloody, bruising encounter. That's going to leave him maimed, walking with a limp for the rest of his life. Who's going to sign up for that? I don't think none of us would, naturally. And God, knowing that, engages with us. Which is why, though there's beauty to Jacob, who is us, there's a greater beauty found in God who's completely different. Notice, he initiates. So, so Jacob is on a journey back home because God told him to through a dream. Go back home, I'll be with you. He initiated the journey back home. Jacob is now in this moment of tremendous fear and trepidation, greatly distressed, anxious. He prays, he gets alone. God comes and begins wrestling with him. He doesn't see God out like, okay, I'm gonna just sit here and wait for somebody to come wrestle with me and then I'm gonna get the blessing and then I'm gonna be good. God sees him alone and God ministers to him through wrestling, God initiates. That's glorious that God comes knowing that he's not gonna come to him. So he goes to God, he goes to him. That's the initiation of God. Not only does he initiate, uh, we see a beauty of his goodness. Now, now, now track this. The only reason why God is initiating with Jacob is to do him good. And by doing him good, to do good to the rest of the world. That was the video. God makes a covenant with his father. Through your seed, the nations will be blessed. So God is trying to do good, not just to this one man, but to the rest of the world. We see his goodness. We see his mercy. Jacob identifies this. So Jacob, verse 29 says, please tell me your name. But he said, why do you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel for saying, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Jacob understood what just happened. He had a face to face encounter with the God of the universe, and he walked away alive to tell about it. 
which means that God was merciful to not smite him every single time as they're tussling and he catches a glimpse of him and God doesn't end him there. That's profound mercy. Furthermore, when this fight ends, it's because God says, all right, we're done, touches his hip and he's limping for the rest of his life, which means that in all of the wrestling, God was restraining his power because he's merciful. If a finger touch would maim him, imagine if he unleashed the fullness of his power in that wrestling moment. It's mercy. We see the mercy of God that Jacob is walking away from wrestling alive and whole. He walked in spiritually broken, but physically whole, and he's walking away spiritually whole, but physically broken. That's the mercy of God. It leads us to great and good things by withholding what we're, what we're due. But we also see a sacrifice. That's the restraint that God withheld his power. He sacrificed. He endured being bruised and beaten in this moment as he's wrestling with Jacob. Oftentimes this is painted as if it's like a tug of war. Like you let me go and I'll let you go. My dude, that's not how wrestling happens. Especially when you're wrestling all night. That it's the middle of the night and you do that till daybreak. A couple hours. First, that's, that's stamina. Can't do it, but he does it. It's not this light, like, <laughs> come on guys, don't. This, it's this ferocious, furious, bruising battle in this moment. And God is allowing himself to experience that so that he could bless him, not sacrifice. And it becomes a picture of the gospel with Jesus. That Jesus would be bruised and beaten and murdered so that we could experience blessing. This is the beauty here. A picture of what it looks like to actually live as a believer to walk and wrestle and not let go. This has been giving me life. It's where I'm at. I want to let go so many times. I've counted six in the past week and a half in various ways, for various reasons, in various circumstances. And the ease to just let go of the ropes and say, man, I'm good. I will figure this out myself is pretty scary. It should scare you. It scares me. But this is Christianity 101. This shatters the categories of how we need to think about God and the hand of God. We are in a season, and, and it's come up in multiple sermons over the last couple of weeks because it's real to me and the conversations I'm having where we are trying to divorce and parse out different attributes of God. So how can we create a loving God that's divorced for everything else about him? And we're just gonna put this loving God right here and everything else that speaks to the attributes of God, they cannot be true. And the reason is, is because we don't have a, mo a robust view of who God is. It's, it's this docile, grandpa-type God that just wants you to sit on his lap and tell you good stories and give you good candy because he's like Santa Claus. Not this ferocious God who says, I have good intentions for you and the globe and if I have to wound you so that the globe would experience tremendous blessings, so be it. Ferocious. Not docile and safe. That's what C.S. Lewis says, right? Chronicles of Narnia. Parallel in Aslan. That lion. Is he safe? Oh no, but he's good. In the same way, this... This, not, this God is not in a box or in a, in a cage that we, we placate to. We just kind of feed him like 
Sunday service attendance and Bible studies and we, and we try to like barter with, no, no, no. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm fierce, I'm ferocious, and I'm after you. And when I come after you, I want you to walk with me and wrestle. And I will be tender and I will be truthful and you will find life. There's some lessons we learned here, that being the overarching lesson that we are meant to walk with God and wrestle with him in faith until we see him face to face. Think about this. Jacob saw 